Okay, in this lecture, we're going to start describing rotational spectroscopy, how we think about rotational motion, how it's based on the 3D rigid rotor and quantum mechanics, what the selection rule of the rotational spectroscopy looks like, and we'll get into rotational constants and the spacing between energy levels in rotational motion and rotational spectroscopy. So uh, maybe we can begin here by thinking uh, something about how light induces rotational motion. Okay, so how could you change your rotational motion? And indeed, that's what you're doing in purely rotational spectroscopy. So in previous lectures, we described electronic spectroscopy, which is the change in organization of electrons. We described vibrational spectroscopy, the change in vibrational amplitudes for given frequencies of a molecule. And now we're going to talk about rotational spectroscopy, okay? And rotational spectroscopy uses microwave radiation, and you don't have enough energy to change vibrational state or change the organization of electrons, so you're only changing the rotational motion. So how does light change this rotational motion? Well, we consider not this particle, but this wave picture of light, where you have a molecule. We've often talked about HCl. So maybe again, here's H. Here's CL, and imagine this between a set of plates, right? And these plates have positive charge and a negative charge. And while there's a dipole here, so chlorine is negative, hydrogen is positive, and so there's going to be a net motion this way and this way. Now, if I'm going to then change the electric field to negative and positive on these plates, right? Well, sometime later, this has moved. I should actually show this having moved. So in the first case, there's the motion, this thing moves. And if I time it right, such that after the chlorine gets up here, it should be bigger, chlorine gets up here and the hydrogen is down here. If I now change it to negative and positive, right? Well, now there's a repulsion of the chlorine here and a repulsion of the hydrogen here, away from the positive turns the negative, towards the negative. And so now there's this rotational motion that I'm inducing. It has everything to do of when I switch these, right? When I switch the signs of this electric field. And so it's no surprise that it depends on, you know, this time varying electric field that is light. So if this light generates this changing electron, uh, electric field at the right frequency, it can induce this type of motion. And so what are the energies of rotation? Okay, and the energies of rotation, well, we've solved the eigen energies from solving Schrodinger's equation. Here, the Hamiltonian for rotational motion was built out of our 3D rigid rotor. And the eigen energies we got out were following this formula, h bar squared, over 2 mu r naught squared l l plus 1 right the wave functions here were spherical harmonics so you can go back and review our lecture on 3d rigid rotors and spherical harmonics and solving the schrodinger equation but these are the eigen energies you get out for the spherical harmonic wave functions that describe three-dimensional rotation. Okay, so we solved the Schrodinger equation with uh, our appropriate Hamiltonian. The potential energy Hamiltonian part of that was zero because it's free rotation. In two dimensions, we use polar coordinates. In three-dimensional, we use spherical coordinates. And so we had this solution of what the energies are uh, for this 3D motion. Now, importantly, this 3D rigid rotor just to review, and all of this math we did applies to what we're talking about here, right? Atoms rotating with respect to one another. But it also applies to, and this is the first time we talked about it, it applies to electrons 
orbiting the nucleus as we were trying to understand what that motion looked like as we were building the hydrogen atom and quantum mechanics. So when the electron was orbiting the nucleus, we called that angular motion and angular momentum. L and the energies it led to h bar squared over 2 mu r naught squared. R is the bond distance here, right, of this rigid bond. And mu is the reduced mass. Okay? And L then is the quantum number that stands for angular motion, angular momentum. Okay? Now, in atoms rotating with respect to each other, we give this angular momentum a different letter so it's not quite as confusing, and we call this J. Okay, so this is really going to be h bar squared over 2 mu r naught squared j, j plus 1. Okay, it's the same formula, we're just swapping out L for electron orbits in atoms for j rotational motion. It's the same kind of physics, so we get the same exact solution to Schrodinger's equation. Okay, so that's a little bit of review of, for where we came up with these rotational energies that we're going to think about in rotational spectroscopy. As a brief aside here, I probably should mention that, you know, this J here is not the same as the term symbols from lectures we gave not too long ago, right? For atomic term symbols, this is not angular momentum. This is a total angular momentum, different J. Right? I know it's confusing, but just keep in mind that this is not the same J as this. This is a quantum number, for the rotational energy state. This has something to do with the total spin orbit coupled angular momentum. Okay, so just make sure we're keeping this rotational J different. It's the quantum number for rotational energy of molecules. So let's think about labeling these J levels on our Morse potential. Again, this Morse potential represents a given organization of electrons. Who knows what it is, but maybe the term symbol that we've talked about in previous lectures that describes this organization of electrons is three sigma G plus, fine. This is a potential energy surface, which tells us the energy as a function of this bond distance R. There are different vibrational energies of the nuclei within, of course, this organization of electrons and we call that n equals zero. We can look at an excited vibrational state, n equals one, and now we can think about for this vibrational motion and this organization of electrons, how does the molecule rotate? Well, there are different energy levels. We can call them j equals zero, j equals one, j equals two, j equals three etc. Keep going up. So this is how we would label them with that rotational quantum number. Now, how do we derive the selection rule? If I want to think about one of these energy levels down here that I'm rotating with, what other J states can I go to? Can I go from J equals zero to J equals two? Can I go from J equals zero to J equals three? Which ones are allowed? That is what a selection rule tells us. And we derive this explicitly for vibrations. Okay. And we talked about doing this for vibrations based on this transition dipole element from state M of the molecule to state M of the molecule with regard to some variable X, where I guess X here we're talking about R instead. That's this bond distance here. So you could say this is a function of R if you wanted. The book that I use uses X instead. So use whatever you want, okay? But this transition dipole has to do with this singular dimension because this is a diatomic. There's only one distance that matters, the distance between the atoms. So for deriving the selection rule, well, it's gonna be the same exact formula we use for the vibrational case, right? Where we're doing an integral for the wave function of the second state M, complex conjugate, of the dipole moment of the molecule, mu, then the original state n, 
where the dipole is a function of this distance x dx. Okay. Now this dipole moment we approximated and used a, a Taylor series to get to the vibrational selection rule. In terms of a rotating molecule, a simple approximation is that this dipole moment is some permanent dipole moment, but is dependent on the angle of rotation. Not too important to worry about now. That's the functional form we're going to use, the functional form of the wave functions here, and the vibrational case we used harmonic oscillators. But here, of course, we're using the spherical harmonics. That is our wave function for rotational motion. You can go back and watch the previous video where we talked more about deriving selection rules for harmonic oscillator and the transition dipole moment for vibrations. You can do the same thing here for rotations using the spherical harmonics, using this functional form. And what you show in the end is that the change in J has to be plus or minus one. Although this will only work for the case here like we've done a diatomic for a linear molecule. Okay, so no need to go through all the math at this stage. That's what you get to in the end. Okay, for linear molecules, and that's basically what we're going to focus on today. We can also show during this, right, extrapolation, if I wanted to, that uh, a dynamic dipole that we talked about, mu prime, this is the one that matters for vibrations. Okay, this falls out when we do this integral. And the only thing that matters is mu naught, this permanent dipole moment. And we talked about this a few lectures ago. We, we uh, sort of foreshadowed this, that the permanent dipole matters for rotations. And the dynamic one does not. And the opposite is true. Only the dynamic matters for vibrations. Go back and watch the previous lecture to learn about the implications of that. But here it's the permanent dipole that matters for rotation. The dynamic dipole drops out completely. And so for purely rotational transitions, like this one, j equals zero to j plus one, for this purely rotational transition, you have to have a permanent dipole. Okay? Now, if we were doing something with IR light where we're changing rotational state and vibrational state, well, all bets might be off there. But for just microwave spectroscopy, not IR light, which is higher energy, but just microwave light, we're obeying this, and the molecule must have a permanent dipole in order to be subjected to the influence of that micro microwave radiation. Now, one thing you might notice here is that when I drew these rotational states, they're getting further apart. Okay? So as I'm thinking about this spacing of j equals 0 to j equals 1 to j equals 2, I'm going to exaggerate it here a little bit, to j equals 3, and so on, the spacing between these is changing. This delta E is different than this j plus 1 delta E. Remember here the energies that I'm caring about is h bar squared over 2 mu r naught uh, squared j times j plus 1. So maybe as an exercise we can think about and walk through why is this increasing? Okay, so let's maybe derive delta E. What is the change in energy? For j to j plus 1. Okay, well, I can think about it's going to be final minus initial. So put in for j, j plus 1, okay, the energy of this excited j plus 1 state will look like this. Instead of j, I have j plus 1. Instead of j, I have j plus 1. And then there's another plus 1. All right, so I'm just substituting each j here, I'm substituting in j plus 1. And so that's the final minus my initial state where j is just j. 
Now I can expand this. This, of course, is J plus 2. And I can FOIL this out. My delta energy here will be h bar squared over 2 mu r naught squared j squared plus 3j plus 2. And down here I have j squared plus j. So this will end up dropping out. One of these j's will cancel one of these here. And in the end, by combining all this, I'll have a spacing between energy levels that looks like this. 2j plus 2. I can factor out of 2, which will cancel with this 2. And I'll get h bar squared over mu r naught squared j plus 1. Okay, thereby proving that the spacing between energy levels here depends on J, the energy level I'm starting at. Okay, so what is going to be the lowest delta E? Well, it's when I'm starting with J equals zero. The spacing of the next is gonna be when J equals one. The spacing of these two is when J equals two. And so this amount of separation between the states, okay, delta E increases with increasing j. Okay, so the spacing delta E depends on j and it increases as j increases, which if you look back and think about the spacing of vibrational states, is exactly the opposite. Vibrational states actually end up getting spaced closer together as you go up. And well, it depends on the functional form of the eigen energies and you can go back and derive this that they get so close spaced together here that they all converge up here and they're basically a bunch of closely spaced states. Okay, so that's one difference between strictly rotational and strictly vibrational energy states. Okay, now usually instead of these types of formulas with J, you're going to see formulas that might look like this. You might encounter a rotational constant B or Bay, depending on how much you like it. So usually you're going to encounter things in terms of uh, B, which sort of wraps up a lot of these constants in the eigen energy formula. So B we're going to set equal to eight pi squared C mu r naught squared. Okay. Now, these rotational constants, obviously it's a lot of constants, but it does depend on the exact molecule you're talking about, right? Because it depends on the bond length and the reduced mass, right? But you can plug all this in to sort of show that the eigenenergy instead of this, you can also write by lumping a lot of these constants together and get something that looks like H c rotational constant that is all this wrapped up j times j plus one but we still have to have the quantum number j in there as well okay this is just much more concise when you look up a rotational constant okay it's not a constant universally but it's a constant for that molecule for that reduced mass where you are assuming again this rigid rotor right this constant bond length okay so the bond length actually is not constant, and that will explain some sort of deviation from, you know, ideal behavior we might expect in rotational spectroscopy. But we'll talk about that in a future lecture, the next one, I believe. We can then also change our delta energy formulas. It looks something like this, 2HCBJ plus 1. This is actually for absorption. And the change in energy is going to be minus 2HC B J for emission. Okay, so this top formula here is the one we derived by putting in J, J plus one here and coming up with this formula 
and then substituting in our new rotational constant b that is sort of the way it's usually written and expressed okay so for absorption when i'm going up in energy right from here to here what is the space and energy well that space and energy is going to be 2 times h times c times b times j plus 1 in this case j is 0 for this transition right j would be 1 for this transition j would be 2 for this transition okay for emission right it's always the one i'm starting from j equals 3 to 2 or 2 to 1 or 1 to 0 and what is that change in energy well that's going to look like this for emission okay and again we care about these energies because this is exactly what we're seeing it's this change in energy we're seeing in a intensity versus frequency or versus energy rotational spectrum right so the peaks i'm going to see in my rotational spectrum are at the frequencies that correspond to these changes in energy right that is what a, a spectrum is when it's involving light you can have mass spectrum but a light spectrum is about that molecule that atom that entity changing quantum energy levels making that quantum leap and so it's the difference in that energy that corresponds to the energy of the peak on here okay so this is not a static thing right this peak here is about a transition between two different energy levels and this change in energy level here is exactly what you're seeing h nu or hc over lambda if you prefer wavelengths so now we have to take this and sort of start to understand what the spectrum looks like because it doesn't look like this that's just you know uh, meant to sort of visualize what the delta e is but what is our rotational spectra really going to look like and that is what we were going to talk about in the next lecture so look forward to that that'll do it for this video and see you next time for more rotational spectroscopy